Good, uh, good evening from Chicago, Illinois. It is about 9 o'clock at night here in the Windy City. It has been quite windy. Actually, the past couple of days we were had a bunch of tornadoes here in Illinois and some wild weather yesterday, but uh, things are calming down. And uh, I'm really happy to be with you tonight to introduce to you one of my uh, long-term friends uh, through Web 2.0 Tools, uh, Kim Casino, who is an international school educator in Japan. And I, I first got to know Kim, I think, through uh, social media in general. And she followed me on uh, Delicious. And I remember her handle was Super Kimbo. So I will always think of her as Super Kimbo. And I actually got to meet her in person uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, she and a bunch of other teachers invited me to um, this amazing, amazing conference. And hopefully she'll talk a little bit about it called Learning to That. Um, teachers in the Asian international schools run. Um, it's been in China for a couple of years, and then this year it was in Singapore, and it was a really, really well done um, event. So I'm excited to bring her, her, her. She is so good at what she does. Everything she does is phenomenal. Great resources, incredibly thoughtful. Um, she's a powerhouse. And so I'm really excited to bring her to you today. Uh, so anyway, just some logistics before we start. Um, you can check your microphone speakers, and if, you, if you're coming from a low bandwidth area, you may want to do that. Um, there, you go to tools, and then audio, and then audio setup. Um, I want to make sure that I've turned on the chat capability. We have the chat capabilities turned on for you, so we're good. You can um, provide a little information about yourself if you want to by putting your profile on here. Um, and that's just kind of some of the basic logistical stuff that we do when we get started. Um, here's Kim. Uh, she's going to be talking about adventures in uh, international education, um, blah, 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 blah. Um, the other thing, too, is if you want to detach your chat panel, it's a little bit easier to see things here. And there's a little drop-down menu um, at the top of the chat window that will let you detach it from the rest of the webinar window. And it may make it easier for you to, to resize it and see the conversation that's going on today. We are using Twitter uh, for back channel. So if you want to tweet out anything that you um, find exciting and any insights you have, please use the hashtag GlobalEd13. I did start the recording. Um, these are some reminders. This is a new slide that we have this year. Uh, we have help on the front page of our name and also in another virtual conference uh, room where our moderators are hanging out. Um, we also have a survey at the end of this where we would love to have your feedback. We also are offering certificates, uh, and there's a link on our main website for this, but you have to, you have to request them, okay? That's, that's the deal. And there's a, a bit of a requirement with the one for attendees, so make sure you read the directions carefully. And we also are still looking for outreach partners to help us get out the word about next year's conference. So if you represent a school or a nonprofit, we'll put your information up on our website if you'll kind of help us get the word out to your network. So those are just a few announcements before we get started. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors who help keep this event free and open for everyone. Iron, who's been, um, this organization has been behind us all the way from the get-go. We really appreciate their work, uh, as, along with the Global Campaign for Education, uh, the United States chapter. We're excited to have them sponsor our new Education for All strand during this event. And you can see our other supporters who've been uh, really tremendous in, in helping us get the word out. So we're going to start with the traditional, where in the world are you? Um, there's, we've got a, oh, we've got more people here than I thought we were going to have. That's great. All 16 of us. Uh, I'm going to give you whiteboard privileges, and you're going to take the tool that looks like a little star to the left of the whiteboard, and you're going to click on the map where you are. I'm going to click on that little star, and here I am somewhere in the Midwest. And we've got two people in Asia. That's great. Yay. Um, so we're, we're, I think the rest of Europe is uh, asleep right now. Uh, we've got somebody in Australia, it looks like. Uh, somebody, I don't know where this person is, way down the left-hand corner, where is that? Um, maybe that's a typo. I don't know what that is. Anyway, there's somebody way down in an island somewhere that I don't know. I need to brush up on my geography. 
So, um, and we've got Canadians over here too. This is fabulous. Great. So, um, so please tell us where you are in the chat. And uh, if you want to add what the weather is like and what time it is where you are, it kind of adds a little bit of a global perspective. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's when you start planning these events, and uh, Kim will tell you from her global projects, I'm sure, you know, being uh, considerate or aware of what time it is in another part of the world is, uh, it becomes a requisite. And when we were trying to plan this presentation, it was never an ideal time between the U.S. and Japan hours. And so we're super glad that Super Kimbo has accommodated us and, and, um, and has made it work for us because it's not easy getting on the same, um, you know, working synchronously like this. So thank you, Kim. Um, we have the slides there, and we're all set to go. I'm going to turn it over to Kim. Thank you so much for being here, and I'll be here to moderate questions for you, Kim, or take care of anything that you need. Thank you very much. Now do I have sound? Better? Okay, sorry. Okay, uh, so uh, I was just saying that thank you so much for having me, and uh, thank you, Lucy, for all those wonderful words about me. I hope I can live up to them. And I was saying that I'm actually at school now, so if something happens and um, the door opens and someone walks in, I might have to deal with it. <laughs> so uh, just letting you know that that could happen. So uh, kind of the focus of my presentation today, um, Lucy and Steve asked me to talk about what it's like to be an international school teacher, how I got here, um, what you can expect to find if you're ever interested in coming here, and kind of what we do. So that's kind of my focus for today. And uh, this is just a little bit, if you're interested in finding out more about me and why I can talk about this, there's some uh, info for me there. So you can see my blog and my Twitter handle. And uh, I've been overseas for 14 years now. I started in Germany, then I worked in Malaysia, and then Thailand, and now I'm in Japan. And for nine of those years, I have been in an IB school, and five of those years, I was in an American curriculum school. And uh, right now, I'm in an IB school, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the difference between those uh, kinds of schools as we go along. So I'm going to break this presentation down into three sections. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own experience, some highlights from that experience, and how you might get started if you're interested in going overseas. And please feel free to stop me at any time or ask a question or pop something in the chat, and I will happily change topics. <laughs> so for the first part uh, about my experience, I am from a small town in Connecticut called Reading, Connecticut. It has 8,000 people. In my graduating high school class, I think we had like 97 students. And uh, when you look out of my parents' window, this is what you see. This is what you would see today, uh, because it's always like that in Reading, Connecticut. And when I went to university, I went to the University of Connecticut, which was, you know, a little bit bigger, but still kind of a similar view out the window. We actually have a place at UConn called Horse Barn Hill. Ironically, there's a lot of cows there, but there are also horses. This is the view from Horse Barn Hill. And after I had been at university for one year, I knew that I wanted to do something different. So um, I applied to study abroad. And I took my first trip overseas when I was 17 in my sophomore year of university and went to Florence, Italy. And I can still remember walking around the corner from a teeny tiny street with a gelato in my hand and then walking out into this piazza with this exact view and seeing the Duomo and just being blown away. And that moment will stay with me forever. I know I love traveling. I know I love being overseas. I know I love going out and experiencing the world in a different way as much as I can. So that was kind of my, my change moment. Um, so after I did that, I went back to university and kind of felt around how I could keep going and ended up teaching uh, after I graduated in Munich, Germany, which is a lovely city and definitely busier than Reading, Connecticut because it's actually a city but still very, like, green and calm and western. Um, and after I lived in Munich for uh, five years, uh, my husband Alex and I decided it was time for something different, so we made a big switch and we moved to Malaysia. And since we've been in Asia, we've lived in Malaysia, Thailand, and Japan. And it's very different over here in Asia. 
Um, we've done a lot of traveling, seen lots of things, um, and our daily life looks, I would say, a little bit more colorful. This is a, a view of Kuala Lumpur, where we lived. Uh, after Kuala Lumpur, we moved to Bangkok, Thailand, and I actually lived, if you can see the little dot in that building, right there. Um, and now we're here in Yokohama, which is part of Tokyo in, in terms of a, like a larger city. It's actually the biggest city in the world when you put those two together. And it's super busy and exciting here in Japan, which we love. So I've gone from this kind of deer in the green pasture view to this crazy, bustling Asian city which is super exciting and fun, and I love every day of it, and I just encourage uh, anybody who's interested to kind of take that leap. So I've learned a lot uh, being overseas, and here are some of the things that um, I think you might find interesting. Before I go into that, can I take a break? Is there anything anybody wanted to kind of ask me about right at this very moment? I can see that people can't see the slides. Can some people see the slides? Yes. Okay. Uh, I've worked with all ages. Um, I started out in middle school and still love middle school. Middle school is my favorite age level, but I've worked at an elementary all the way up to high school. Any other questions I can answer at the moment? All right. I'll tell you about some highlights. I'm going to start with telling you a little bit about international schools. Uh, where I'm currently working now is Yokohama International School. It's actually the second oldest international school in the world. The first one is in Geneva. Um, you can see it was um, founded in 1924. And the exciting thing about international schools, I think, is they're often founded by the families that are living in that city. So there's um, expat families that are living in a, in a city, uh, in a country that's not their home country, and they want their children to go to school, and they want their children to go to school in an environment that they know is transferable to other countries. So YAS is one of those very first schools that was founded um, that way. Most international schools are in English, if you're, if you're hearing the term international school, but there are French, German, um, French and German are probably the biggest ones, Japanese international schools, and those would be in the host uh, country language. So like there were Japanese international schools in Bangkok, for example, and the language of instruction there would be Japanese or Chinese, exactly. So the schools, obviously, that I would work in would be language of instruction is English. And we're not teaching English. It's just a regular school like a, um, like a private school uh, in the U.S. And I guess what's um, nice about them is that they are very community driven. The whole purpose of being here is to support the community that's here, the community that wants uh, English language instruction or whatever the case may be, and wants their kids to connect with other students from other different cultures while they're living in this country. So it feels very, especially here at YS, I have to say, it feels very much like a, an extended family. One thing, um, okay, so I'm going to go to a question and then I'm going to come back to my own slide. How do you learn about the community before you start teaching there? I'm going to talk about that a little bit later at the end, but I guess the uh, most important thing would be to do your research and either talk to people who are already there or visit or um, just try to make connections with as many people as you can. Once you're in the international school circuit for a while, you tend to know the different schools. And um, one thing that's important to know, and I'm going to talk about this again as well, that there's private schools that are nonprofit, and there are private schools that are for-profit. And the culture of those schools can be very different. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I've been fortunate to spend most of my career in nonprofit schools, but I have worked in a for-profit school before, and that can be very different. So that's one thing to really think about. Different how? Uh, well, when it's a school run for profit, the ultimate goal is profit. So the money doesn't come back into the school the way a nonprofit school would. So at a nonprofit school, when they, all of the proceeds from the school go back into technology, to paper, to teacher salaries, to teacher benefits, to refurbishing the building, to uh, renovating the gym, all of that money comes back into the school. If you're in a for-profit school, it's very common that that money is going into the owner's pocket. So that's a distinction right there that I would recommend you consider before uh, taking a job at an international school. And of course, cultures can be different at every school. I might mean, have worked at four schools, and every school was different. But that aspect of 
how the school is financially supported and run and managed and how teachers and students and families are dealt with can be very different just by basis of what's going on with the money. So another thing to consider is that international schools are different in their curriculum models. I mentioned at the beginning that I'm working in an IB school now, and I spent most of my career working in IB schools. That's where I feel really comfortable. Um, the IB is a curriculum model that runs from early learning up to high school. You may have heard of the diploma program. And basically, the IB is uh, kind of a, more of a holistic, um, kind of project-based approach to learning, not so heavily focused on grades, really kind of student-centered. Um, and then I've also worked in an American curriculum school, which is very much like an American school in the U.S. Um, still would be like a private school kind of environment where we don't have to worry about that high stakes testing because that's not involved here. You, schools may choose to do some standardized tests, but it's not the same as in uh, North America where you have to follow those expectations. But the curriculum models would be similar. And then tons of my friends have worked in British schools or Australian schools. I, I just haven't. But there are different schools will have different curriculum models, so that's another thing kind of to consider. Um, one of the best things about working in an international school is that we get to work with awesome kids, and I will keep coming back to that topic because that's my favorite part. Um, but one of the really amazing things about being overseas is knowing that these kids are all third culture kids. And or many of them are third culture kids. I shouldn't say all of them because we do have plenty of um, uh, host country nationals in our international schools. Uh, but a third culture kid is one who's growing up outside of their home culture. So let's say their parents are, for example, I have an Israeli student in this photo. Parents are Israeli, but he's living here in Japan before this. He lives in the United States before this. He lives somewhere else. I've got a Korean, an Indian, a uh, Swedish, and I think Zion is Norwegian. So all these kids are from different countries. They're, they've all grown up outside of their home country, and they're here together at this international school. So basically, Every day I'm entirely, totally, completely jealous of them because they have these amazing uh, international lives. I'm just checking the questions. Uh, yes, the t-shirts are from the Flat Classroom Conference, Julie. Pop that one in there. <laughs> uh, a nice thing about international schools is that they really have a global perspective. They're thinking about things from many different approaches, right? Because the kids are coming from all different places, the teachers are coming from all different places, the parents are coming from all different places, even often the board members are from all different countries. So everything that we do, we have this kind of global outlook. How will that be perceived by people from this culture? How will that be perceived by people from this culture? How can we communicate and collaborate successfully with this very mixed uh, group of people that we're, we're part of? That's kind of an overview of international schools. Let me just stop there, and then I'm going to talk about these key highlights here, of lifestyle, teaching, learning, and challenges. Is there anything that I haven't answered? Oh, does your area of certification matter? Um, I would say, generally speaking, schools do try to look for you being certified in your field, but I don't think it's, it would stop you. However, you really have to be certified. So, for example, if you're a certified elementary teacher, but you really want to move into, let's say, PE, and you have experience doing elementary PE, I don't know that that would stop you. I think you would definitely be more desirable if you had the correct certification. Um, a PhD can work for you and against you. Uh, many schools will have a salary scale. And I have some good friends who've gone through and gotten their PhD and, and find themselves priced out of jobs. So you want a classroom job, but because you have a PhD, you're up higher on the salary scale. And that can be something that comes into play. So that's something just to consider. No matter what, they're expecting you to have teacher certification from your home country. So I'm from the U.S., so my teacher certification has to be from the state of Virginia. And every five years, I renew that certification because when I move again, I need that certification to be valid. Even if your process is different, as long as you're certified in your home country, it's usually okay. Um, anything else that anybody asked that I need to answer? I don't see anything. Okay. I'm going to keep going then. So this whole next section is going to sound like I'm bragging, and I'm really not. I'm just trying to tell you how, how it is. I feel really lucky to have found this um, environment. I just think 
every day, literally every day, I'm thankful that I, I work in international schools, that I know that I can keep doing this. Uh, I love where I am right now, but I know I could go somewhere else if I really wanted to. So I apologize if this sounds super over the top, and anybody who's overseas and thinks I'm being over the top, please uh, please call me out on it. Um, but I I really I love it, and I highly encourage you to consider it if it's a possibility for you. So I'm going to start talking about lifestyle. And of course, the first thing that I think of is all the opportunities we have for traveling. Uh, I was here at a weekend workshop this weekend, and I was chatting with some of my other colleagues about, um, you know, what are some of the highlights of being overseas. And one of my friends said, well, the conversation isn't about whether or not we're going to buy a new car. It's whether we're going to go to Thailand or Philippines for the break. And that is so true. I mean, that's all that we talk about. Not all that we talk about, but that's a great part of our lives is that we get to experience so many different cultures. And like teachers in in your country, right, in your home country, we have those same vacations. But for us, most of us will travel. So, for example, this past October, I went to Thailand with my husband. In Christmas, we're going to go to Hawaii. And maybe in April, we'll go back to Italy again or something like that. And most teachers will take those breaks to actually go somewhere, which, yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Um, another key highlight is you're immersed in whatever environment you happen to be in, and, and it can be confronting. Like, I find this picture a little bit, whew, that's kind of full on. So it can be that kind of experience if you're in a developing country or a country maybe that you don't know that much about. Or it can be just what I feel here, this kind of like crazy big city. I'm in the middle of it. It's exciting. It's fun. Um, but, but I kind of understand what's happening here. So this idea of being in another culture all the time and getting to experience that lifestyle is definitely a highlight. I feel like I understand a lot more about the world and about different people's perspectives and why they might feel that way because I've lived it as opposed to just visited. I'm just going to pause. I see someone's asking, do you care, cookies asking, do you rent furnished apartments? Uh, it, it depends on the country. In both Thailand and Malaysia, I had a furnished apartment. In Munich and uh, Yokohama, I furnished my own apartment. Just kind of depends on, on how how it works where you are. Um, a, a kind of exciting thing for me is I feel this, like, the best way to describe it, I feel, I feel at home between worlds. So, like, I live in Japan. I'm from the United States. I've lived in many other countries, but I feel comfortable in all of the places that I go, which is a nice feeling. Like, I feel like wherever I go, I can find something that makes me feel at home, and it can become my home. So I don't have, like, a... Um, so much of a fear of, of differentness or foreignness that maybe I used to before I did all this traveling. Um, Lucy's asking, do I feel odd not having roots? I feel like it's interesting. I would still always classify myself as American, and I would still always see where my parents is as a place where, like, I kind of have a long-term connection. Um, but I feel like my home is wherever I am. So wherever my husband and I are, that's my home. When I go away, I come home to Japan. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I like it. It might not be for everybody. I like it. <laughs> um, I love seeing different cultures. I love being part of celebrations. You know, you, you can be on the street and something's suddenly happening, and you have no idea what's going on, but you know you're part of something important and uh, for the people where you're at, and that's kind of a really exciting feeling. And I love being able to go in and among different cultures um, as you're traveling. So this picture is not my own. You can see they're all Creative Commons licensed, but uh, this is a picture of Nepal. And it's just, you know, places you never thought you would be able to go, you can go and get a real understanding of, of what life is like there. And because you're connected with people who are teaching in all those places, you see what you see, and then you talk to people who live there, and you get kind of that deeper appreciation for what's going on. And that's kind of just your regular, everyday conversation. Um, just another side story, we happen to have a little party here at school last Friday. We do these um, Friday kind of happy hour things every now and again. And we were having a conversation about a certain market stall in the weekend market called Chattachuk in Bangkok and how to get there on the Sky Train. And one of my other colleagues was like, only in an international school would you be sitting on a Friday afternoon chatting about how to get to one specific market stall in a market in another country that only runs on the weekends that nobody lives in. But it's just so common that we're going to be doing that kind of traveling that that's a normal, everyday conversation for us. Every day is an adventure. You never know what's going to happen. Um, I think for me that would be the hardest part about going back to the U.S. 
it feels predictable because I grew up there and I understand why things happen and how they happen. And that's a good thing, right? It's safe, it's comfortable, it feels nice. But it's also, for me, become a little bit like, well, if I know what's going to happen, <laughs> why am I there? I want to go somewhere where I don't know what's going to happen to me today. You know, am I going to go try and buy, I don't know, a pair of pants and not be able to find them? Like, it's just, it's just kind of a fun, every day, who knows what's going to happen. I love that feeling. Um, I mentioned a number of times about how uh, schools are so community driven, and I, I just think that's really worth mentioning again. This happens to be we run a Pecha Kucha night uh, every year, and what I love about, particularly about YS, is not only do the teachers pre present, it's kind of a PD opportunity, but the parents come in and present, and the students are often um, performing and uh, helping with us, and if they wanted to present, they absolutely could too, maybe just yet they're not ready to come out and do that. But um, that idea that we kind of spend time together and we know each other as more than just, oh, this is a work colleague or this is a parent, um, there's a little bit of blurred lines there, which sometimes can be uncomfortable, but most of the time it's actually really nice because I feel like I know the kids and their families as opposed to just knowing the kids in my subject area, for example. I think we have a lot of fun. I think that's a huge highlight of working in international schools. Because we don't have that um, standardized testing kind of mentality, our, what we do at work is we do things that are fun. Um, and we have fun outside of school. We have fun together. We have fun with kids. We have fun on field trips. It, there's just, we, we're here because we're enjoying what's going on in our lives, and everybody kind of feels that way. Um, sometimes I would say parents, some love it, and some uh, don't love being in the different country because oftentimes they're moved because of their job. But for the most part, the teachers that are here, they're here because they chose to be here. And that, that means our lives are a lot of fun. Um, and this idea of discovery, there's always something new to discover around the corner that you, you just don't know, whether it's in your daily life, whether it's on your holidays, whether it's in your conversations with parents and you realize you have a connection you didn't know you had or a teacher. I can't count the number of times that I've run into students on vacations. And we're genuinely happy to see each other because we like each other because we're having fun. Um, all right, sorry. Let's see. I'm going to go back to the questions. Um, sorry. Is, with no testing mentality, are your students included in the country stats? That's a good question. I don't think so. I don't know the answer, but I would guess no. If anybody knows the answer, please pop it in here. Um, do you find the same kind of limitations? No, we don't, we are really well connected here because there isn't as much of a fear about knowing your students as people as there might be in the United States. So generally speaking, my rule is I try not to um, be friends with students that I'm currently teaching on Facebook, but once I'm not teaching them, I think it's fine. And then oftentimes they'll friend me while I'm currently teaching them, and I'll just have a quick conversation with them and let them know that next year or, you know, whenever you're not in my class anymore, then I'll friend you. And uh, tons of kids follow the teachers on Twitter, and we'll often follow them back and Instagram. And you just get that other little window into their lives. And what's really nice about that is because we know them as people, when issues do come up, they often come up really quickly and we can deal with them right away, as opposed to trying to put this barrier that means we're not seeing what's going on in social spaces, means that when something happens, it takes a long time to deal with. We don't have, um, have that as much. Um, do teachers get evaluated? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, we have a really exciting process here. Maybe I'll talk about that in a minute because I realize I haven't even gotten onto the teaching part of things. Um, but we do have an uh, evaluation process. Every school will have some kind of evaluation process for sure. I would say generally speaking, it's rare that teachers get fired. That's just kind of not, I think, part of education in general. But yes, we definitely are evaluated. Um, another thing that's great about living overseas is seeing the world through new eyes. And I think every time you move to a new country, you just get a whole new perspective on the world. Like, I feel like I've been really lucky to have lived in four places I've really enjoyed, and they've all been very different. And I guess maybe the most different, but also somehow the most similar, is Japan. And um, every 
every way that a Japanese person would do something usually is the exact opposite of how I would do it. But I love that I can understand why they would do it that way and how it's part of their culture and why it's so important to do it that way, even though maybe I wouldn't want it to be done that way or I wouldn't do it that way if I was in charge, being able to understand why and how they make those decisions, that's fascinating. Um, and feeling that way about many different countries, that's like, I think that's a, the best gift that teaching overseas has given me. All right, now I should pause and look at questions again. Um, okay, do you use Skype in the classroom? Yes, we do use Skype in the classroom. Any teacher can use Skype at any time. Uh, lots of our teachers are on Twitter. Lots of our teachers have personal learning networks. Uh, many of our teachers are Cotail graduates, and uh, Cotail is a certificate of educational technology and information literacy that Jeff Utech and I um, founded and, and is really popular among international educators. So they have a big personal learning network to people who have graduated from Cotail and use all the tools we use for socializing, they use them for learning. Um, are you able to understand the culture of a new country and change your ways of teaching with respect to the place? Uh, for sure, I think that's part of being overseas, is respecting the host country. I do think, however, international schools are their own kind of community, and even though things that you might do in Japanese school, we might not do them in international school because we are an international community. So there's this idea of respecting the culture and being respectful of the culture and understanding the culture, but it doesn't mean we do everything the way they would do it if we were in a Japanese school because we're not. We're an international school. So we kind of do things the same, probably a lot the same way you might do them if you were in your home country, but in an international setting. Um, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to repeat, so if you can ask that again, Cookie, then, then I can tell you. Are there age limitations? Ooh, good question. Yes. Many countries do have age limitations for retirement. I know Japan is one of them, and I feel like it's like 55 or something, like actually quite low. So different countries have different limitations, and you'd have to look into that. Um, okay, I'm going to just look for more questions. Uh, do you think we're more restricted with technology in our American classrooms? I don't work in the U.S. right now, uh, so it would be hard for me to make an all-out statement on that. Uh, but from what I read, I would say we have pretty much access to anything we want. So we can use – the Internet is not – filtered for anything here except for really extreme explicit images um, and content. So that's all filtered out. But in terms of accessing, we can use Facebook in class. We can use Twitter in class. We can use Skype in class. Nobody has to ask permission. They just do it. Hi. <laughs> um, so that kind of stuff, I feel, like I, don't, I feel like I don't have any restrictions. So I hope that answers the question without saying anything negative about anybody. Um, global projects that students and teachers are engaged in. I have done lots of work along those lines over the years. Um, right now, I would say the um, focus for me is helping teachers understand why they would want to do that and having individual teachers uh, work on those things. I got a ping, which must mean Lucy has a question. So I'm going to turn off my mic and video and pause for a minute and see if there's something that. Uh, I don't think anybody actually did. Sometimes people raise their hands and it makes that ping sound. I don't know who did. I don't see a hand up right now, actually. We can do that at the end. We can do the, the raising of hands. But I think we're doing okay right now, Kim. Thanks. Okay. Then I will just keep going. Um, so right now I would say for global projects, I would say it's up to the individual teacher. My role is a technology coach, so I support them. So for example, in grade five, they're collaborating with a school in Switzerland that also does the PYP, and they're working together to um, uh, share comments back and forth on each other's blogs. Uh, in grade 11, IB Diploma Program English, I've got teachers Skyping in authors of text that they're reading and talking about that. So in every different grade level, there's something going on. Uh, but because primarily I'm a coach, it's not so much. For me in my classroom. Um, okay, when children enter back into the community after school, do you think they're able to blend well, even though they've grown up in international schools? This is a really interesting um, a question, Taru, and I think it's something that different cultures handle differently. I know from my experience that particularly students coming back to Japan, back to Korea from overseas, so that would be Korean students going back to Korea, Japanese students going back to Japan, because those societies really value um, 
inclusiveness or conformity, and I don't, I hesitate to use the word because it has negative connotations, but um, that can be really challenging, and particularly going back into local schools, so the same kind of school you would go to if you had grown up there and, and never been in an international school. I do think that's really challenging. I often think that um, third culture kids or kids that grow up overseas don't necessarily see the advantage until they're an adult. Sometimes it feels hard to be away from your home country or in an international school. Sometimes we'll have kids really clinging on to, it can be Japanese students, really clinging on to their Japanese heritage because they feel like every day they're in an international environment and they don't want to lose the Japanese-ness that they have. Um, so there's lots going on in terms of culture and and how that kind of plays out as they grow up. And there's actually quite a few really great videos on the topic that third culture kids have been making. I feel like I've seen like four of them in the last year or so. So if there's a moment when I can stop, I'll try to put some in the chat. Um, maybe I'll write a blog post about it too with just some resources because it's really interesting. Um, are there opportunities for U.S. students to talk? To, yeah, there's always opportunities for students to collaborate with our students. Um, you can send me an email, and we can try to find a, a grade level or a classroom that specifically would be interested in doing that, of course. Um, what's the difference in our cultures that supports more openness with Internet where you are in contrast to us in America? I don't think the difference is the culture of the country that I'm in. I think the difference is the culture of the school. Generally speaking, um, most international schools, and this is a huge generalization here, um, are fairly progressive, and in particular, uh, nonprofit board-run schools that have leadership that are progressive are progressive. Um, so schools can be very different depending on the administrators that are in, in the school at the time. So you, you hear stories of, oh, that used to be such a great school, and then the um, head of school changed, and the to whole tone changed drastically. So I think that's something that you think about as you're researching. Uh, what kind of administration, what kind of culture does the school have, even right now at this very moment, what kind of culture have they had historically? Uh, because there are plenty of international schools that would be closed off um, and have that all those kind of same restrictions that you would have in North America. I just am, have been very fortunate not to work in a place like that. Um, what are some of the more creative ways teachers have dealt with time zone, time zone differences? Oh, that's just a, a constant fun, <laughs> fun adventure. I mean, I, working asynchronously often is one, one way that you have to deal with it. There have been different tools over the years that I've used to get kids to communicate asynchronously. Um, yeah, I think I, I, don't, I don't have anything at the top of my head, but aside from communicating asynchronously and using uh, documentation strategies like creating videos or creating Google Docs or creating things where the stuff will be there, um, now, any time that students look, that's something that we do all the time. Um, sometimes I've had uh, whole classes come in hours after school has ended to do a Skype session with another class. So people are willing to do stuff like that. People are willing to be at home and have, you know, Skype in to a larger group from home. That's not unheard of. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk about teaching now, uh, some of the key highlights of teaching overseas. And I've mentioned a lot of this already, so sorry if it's a bit of a repeat. Um, but first and foremost has to be the fabulous kids. I don't know how or why it works like this, but I feel like every school I've worked in has just been amazing kids, kids that are enthusiastic about learning. They're happy to be at school. They enjoy challenging themselves and seeing how they can be better. Um, they're kind and respectful to the teacher. In general, I think uh, parents, uh, particularly in Asian countries, tend to have a, a high level of respect for um, teachers, and that's a really nice kind of environment to work in. We have involved and supportive parents. This is a, a shot from our parent tech coffee mornings that we host every couple of months, and parents want to know what their kids are doing. They want to be part of their children's lives. They want to hear how, how we're teaching, why we're teaching this, how it can impact their children, and they'll come to school and learn with us. And I, I just love that they'll come during the day, they'll come in the evening. Whenever we host something, they would be here all the time if they could, I think. Um, and, and they're super happy that we do this stuff. Uh, there's always positive feedback and thank yous for running these kind of um, parent training sessions. So this one, I forget, I think we're doing Google Calendar or something in this particular picture. Um, last month, which we just had two weeks ago, we talked about digital citizenship. And parents wanted ideas for um, creating contracts with their children for how to um, safely and responsibly use 
computers at home. Um, so that's great. Uh, we're super well resourced. Primarily, you'll find this in um, nonprofit schools, uh, more so maybe than profit schools. Uh, but we really get pretty much everything we need. Uh, here at YES, we're a one-to-one -one school, so every student in grades 6 to 12 has their own laptop that they take home. Um, in grades 4 and 5, they each have their own laptop, but they stay at school. Um, in kindy, they have uh, iPads and laptops, like a class set that they share amongst kindy in grade 1. And in 2 and 3, they have a cart uh, that they share, and there's enough for every kid to have a laptop. They just stay on the cart. So we kind of scaffold that uh, process all the way up. Um, and in terms of other things, you know, we can get those things too. Like we just started a Lego robotics program here. We haven't had that in the past. Um, we just got a 3D printer. So like if there's things that you're interested in, you're passionate about it, and you want to do it, the school will support you to do that. It doesn't mean we get everything every time we ask for it, but generally speaking, the school's uh, really well supported. Um, another aspect of international schools that I found out is um, maybe unusual uh, to home country curriculums, and I don't know if that's true or not, so that's just a conversation I had recently, is this concept of service learning. So one of the things that's really important, uh, particularly in IB schools, is the idea of doing service and having it be part of your curriculum and part of your learning process. So we really value that time helping others and um, doing service projects and bringing them back into the classroom. It's a, it's a big part of life um, at school. And some schools do it better than others. I think our school is really working towards making it a bigger part of our school um, life here. And that, that's a really nice feeling because very often our students are the privileged ones, whether they're local students or foreign students. They are the ones that are kind of this globally elite economic class that move between cultures pretty seamlessly because they have the finances and the means to do so. Um, generally speaking, I would say international schools are pretty flexible. We can, we can adapt what we want from our home country cultures and leave behind what doesn't work. Um, we can uh, switch gears mid-year because something's not working and change, and we don't have um, so many rigid structures we have to work in. Having said that, of course, a school can be very rigid because that's the way the uh, leadership style is, but in general, um, I would say most international schools that I know of, if they hear something great that's happening, they're going to take advantage of it and, and run with it. And we're really good at change because uh, we have teachers coming in and out every year. Um, there's always new students. There's always um, new things happening. We, I think, feel comfortable and embrace and enjoy change. Not everybody, of course, but in general, the feeling is that change can be a really good thing. And I like that because I feel that way myself, so it really works for me. Okay, so that was teaching. Let me go back to the questions. Um, okay, I don't see too many questions that I haven't answered, so I'm going to keep going. Um, so learning. So in addition to all those great things about teaching in international schools, as uh, professionals, we also have a lot of opportunities for learning. And I love that. So for example, um, if you have an idea for a consultant you want to bring in, or you have an idea for a workshop you want to run, or you have an idea for something you want to do for the whole staff, anything is possible. It's, it's really all about student learning and then how we can support that best by elevating what teachers um, know how to do and why to do it. Uh, so really, that idea of being a learner and that professional growth is a really a priority in international schools. Um, here at YS, I feel really lucky that we have extensive PD. Uh, this is an example of a mini conference that we host here called Beyond Laptops, and it's kind of an invite-only event for one-to-one -one schools that are in the Asia region, and we talk about what happens once you've got the laptops, how do you move beyond the hardware, and think about transformative learning. What does that look like? And it's great because schools send teams of four people. They come in for the weekend, and we learn together. Um, we're always learning. There's always opportunities for something new, and we're always willing to try something new. And that idea that um, if something good comes along, let's take advantage of it is very common for professional learning as it is for student learning. We have this great international network of people that we learn from. Um, my friends are people in many different schools. So this happens to be a picture from the Learning 2.0 conference this past year in Singapore. And that's my seat, so I took the photo. And those are all the people that were on the conference organizing committee and uh, somewhere at the leadership level of the conference. And all of those people are teaching in different schools all around Asia and beyond. 
you know, maybe five people in that room are from the same school, and it's the school where the conference was hosted. So that idea that we network, um, not just within our immediate local area, but on kind of a global scale and a regional scale, that's really exciting. That's a great opportunity for PD. Um, we have weekend workshops all the time. We just had one with uh, Adrian Cam from uh, Australia, and he came in and did a workshop for us on game-based learning. And the idea that we can bring in these consultants and offer kind of new and exciting models for teaching and learning, and, and we have them here at our school. We don't have to go anywhere, even though everyone loves going to conferences, of course. <laughs> um, another kind of anything is possible idea is we host the Coattail program here, the Certificate of Educational Technology and Information Literacy that I run. And because I run it, when I came in the first year, I said, hey, can I host this here? Can I use the school facilities and host this program? And obviously all of our teachers are welcome, but also I want teachers from Tokyo to come in and have many different schools represented. So we're now on our second cohort, and it's a, a five-course program, so it's a postgraduate program that is five courses, it takes a year and a half, we're on our second cohort, and we have teachers from 10 different schools. So how great is that, that my 10 teachers from YAS are connecting with teachers from all around Tokyo and collaborating and learning together and building their network um, right here at YAS. We have student involvement in this kind of PD, which is really exciting too. I love that aspect of international schools, that students are really given a lot of responsibility and authority and ownership over what they're doing, and we want to hear what they think. We want what we're doing to be authentic. So it's we're doing it and not the teachers are doing it to the students. Um, so for example, when we wrote our um, Connected Learning Community, that's our one-to-one -one program, when we wrote our handbook, students were involved in that process, students and parents. So it's really a very kind of collaborative environment. Um, and one of my friends was mentioning on the weekend as well, like because teachers are from so many different countries and have so many different backgrounds, Every time we have a conversation, we're seeing things from varied perspectives. So this is the way maybe we used to do it in North America, but this is how we do it in Australia, and this is how we do it in the UK, and this is how we do it in Canada. And so being able to have those conversations, and then this is the Japanese perspective. You know, having, looking at things from so many different angles really helps you grow as an educator. All right, I'm going to check for questions again. Yes, you can do Coattail online. Uh, it's Coattail.com. I'll just put it in the chat. You can find out more there. Um, Lucy, with lesson study, what I would call lab site, where the teacher goes in and teaches the class, and then other teachers watch. If that, I remember um, somebody telling me about lesson study, and maybe we do something similar. So for coaches or for visiting consultants, we'll often have them come in and teach a lesson. The teachers will meet with the coach or the um, visiting consultant beforehand, find out what they're going to learn, then they'll watch the coach or the consultant teach the lesson, and then they'll debrief afterwards. Yeah, it's a Japanese method. I think it's very similar. I personally call it a lab site, and I always forget what lesson study means. But yes, I think we do something similar to that. Um, lots of positive enthusiasm from the crowd about IB schools and how great they are. <laughs> okay, so when I was making this presentation, my friends were like, you can't have it all be positive. You have to talk about the challenges. You've got to be realistic. So even though I think everything's great, I was able to come up with a couple of challenges. So here are some challenges I think that, you know, you might experience if this is something you're interested in. First and foremost, of course, you're taking a risk. You're going to a new school in a new country with new people, and as much research as you do in advance, you may not know what's really going on. Um, you know, we came here the year of the March 11th earthquake. For us, we don't feel like we need to leave. But there were people who left, plenty of people in Tokyo and Yokohama who left and didn't come back after that. So you don't know that that is going to happen. Uh, that's, a big, that's a big situation. You really can't predict that anywhere you are. But the same thing could happen. There's a school right now um, in Indonesia that last year, it's a privately owned school, so you'll hear more stories um, from privately owned schools, where the board, the owners, the board and owners decided they didn't like the way the school was going, so tons of teachers got um, kind of their contracts were not renewed. So this, these kinds of things can happen overseas. You don't, you don't always know 100% what you're getting into, so that's a risk. Of course, there's that feeling of being distant and far away from your home country and far away from your family. I know for us, we go back to um, where uh, my parents and Alex's parents live. We go back once a year. Um, 
I grew up Catholic. It's hard to only go once a year. I get a lot of guilt about that. Um, but that's all that I really have time for. When I go, I want to make the most of my time. You know, we go and we stay with my family, and we stay there for six weeks. It's a lot of togetherness time with my family, and I love being there. Um, but that's it. It's once a year. It's, we're not going home on Thanksgiving. We're not going to the baby shower. We're not going to the brunch. We're not going to the wedding. We're there for a chunk of time in the summer, and that's really it. Um, of course, living in a country where you don't speak the language is challenging. I kind of see it as fun, but sometimes that's really upsetting. You don't understand what people are saying around you. You can't read the signs. The whole world is different than what you're used to. Um, so that can be confronting or challenging. Um, sometimes there's a question of whether or not the school is international. And I think I talked about this a little bit uh, as well. There's lots of new schools coming up using the word international. But actually, it's really full of host country nationals and really has the culture of the host country. And that's not always a real international school. So knowing what kind of school it is is important as well. And sometimes you get to a place like Japan is a great example where it's a wonderful place to live. People come and they don't leave. And they've been there for 35 years. And they want to do the same thing they did the first year they got here, even though it's 35 years later. Um, so there's that aspect, too, amongst um, working with staff. And that can happen in any country because people go to a new place and decide they love it and they stay. Um, yeah, so that's it for that. Let me see if there's any questions here I can share. Um, length of contract, initial contract is almost always two years. Um, Coattail uh, for credit through SUNY, State University of New York, Buffalo State, is um, for international school teachers exclusively. You can take the program and um, not get university credit. However, you can take the only online version. Um, yes, we get medical insurance through the school. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to get started. Someone's at the door, so I may be interrupted in a minute. I'm just waiting to see how that plays out. If you're interested in going overseas, here are some of my general tips for you. Um, the first one is, if you're new to international schools, a really good way to get started is going to a recruitment fair. There are two major fairs, uh, Search Associates and International School Services. There are others. Those are just two of the biggest ones. And it's like any job fair you might imagine. You go into a room, you line up, you give them your resume, and you see if they want to interview you. And it's a little bit weird because when they do say they want to interview you, they're interviewing you in their hotel room. Um, so there's kind of a screening process, and then your meeting is, is in the hotel room of the, of the head of school. So those, that's a way to get started. Um, another thing that can be really useful is building your network getting to know different people in different countries and knowing where you might want to live and contacting those schools directly. I know that Search and ISSS always recommend that you don't pick a location first because often it's hard to get where you exactly want to go, that you just open yourself up to any possibility. And you might not know that the perfect job is waiting for you and you didn't realize it um, without going to a fair or being open to all those options. But just knowing about the schools that are in different countries can help you make good choices. We mentioned this before, make sure you keep up your certification because that's expected. Um, find some way to kind of make yourself stand out. I think having some kind of portfolio is really well received in international schools, becoming more standard. So mine obviously is electronic and generally speaking, I think that makes it a lot easier to get the material to the recruiters when they're in different countries. So finding a way to kind of make yourself stand out from the crowd would be useful. Um, consider what kind of curriculum you'd feel comfortable in. Do you like a holistic, project-based, concept-based environment? Or do you like teaching discrete subjects and having that kind of clear boundary between subject areas? That could be an important aspect to your recruiting process. Um, look for accredited schools. I, 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 this sounds weird, but um, keep in mind that we have the same kind of accreditation process that schools in your home country do. So we're accredited by, um, I always pronounce it NESAC. New England Association of Schools and Colleges, um, and previous schools, we were accredited by WASP, the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. So the same services that accredit schools in North America will accredit international schools as well. So make sure the, school, the schools that you're looking at are credible and, you know, have history, and I would recommend a nonprofit school if you can manage it. Um, and then once you make that decision and you get that job, the movers come and pack everything for you. You don't have to do anything. This is my house all packed up from KL. So it's easy from the, once you sign that contract, it's just fun. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. So 
So where will you guys go? That's my question for you. And I know I'm going to get kicked out of here in five minutes because it's the end of uh, the hour here. So any questions that I can answer for you guys? I think uh, one person asked if the Coattail program was open to people outside of international schools. Any, um, any more, uh, thoughts on that? Yes, yes. I did try to answer that. Um, it is open to teachers that are in uh, the United States but not for SUNY credit. If you would like to get SUNY credit, you have to be in an international school. Go Zanga University, I think that's how you pronounce it, in California, is offering teacher certification credits with us. So you can either get teacher certification credits through Go Zanga, or you can get just a Coattail certificate, or if you're overseas, you can also get the SUNY credit. So we actually have three levels, and I think all of that should be described on Coattail.com, so please have a look, and if you have any questions, just let me know. Okay, uh, another uh, question. Um, somebody asked about uh, what do you do if you have a non-teaching spouse and two dependents? Uh, does that lessen your chances of getting hired? And then if you want to speak to, I don't know if you want to speak to specific um, fairs or agencies that people usually go through, I don't know if that if you want to address that or not, but that might be helpful to sure. people who are really serious about this. Okay. Uh, it is harder when you have dependents, and so that's an important realization to make now. Some schools, it's no problem. At ISB, I would say, it, I used to work at International School Bangkok in Thailand, which is a really big school, and they have teacher housing. Um, I would say we had easily 10 dependent spouses and kids two, three kids, and it was not a problem because of the way the school was structured. Um, in other areas, like here in Japan, it would be way too expensive for you to come here to Japan with a dependent spouse and two kids. You, it would not be financially viable for you. The school would be irresponsible to hire you, so they would tell you that in the recruiting fair. So it depends on where you're going and what the school has set up and what the cost of um, living is in that country. So some places, no problem. Other places, a lot harder. And then job fairs, uh, they're very similar, those two fairs. Uh, people who are overseas, you can put some stuff in the comments if you have opinions. I personally like ISS. That's just my personal opinion. Um, some people love search. Uh, there's an, a fair in Iowa that people go to. There's a fair for South American schools. There's uh, the ECIS fair. There are tons of different international school um, recruiting fairs. I think search and ISS are the biggest ones, and they're basically the same. You pay, they help you find a job. Sometimes they find you a job, sometimes they don't. They're kind of the negotiator between you and the school. I don't know that there's universities that are that are like this. I mean, I, I guess any university could be like this. So I'm, I'm not sure. I couldn't answer that question. Okay, I know I'm going to have to go in two minutes. So any other Questions. Oh, so Carol is saying about TIE, the International Educator, that is another really good resource. Uh, they post jobs online all the time. Oh, and another way to do research if you feel like you really want to get kind of the gossip on schools, uh, there's a website called International Schools Review, and that one, um, usually it's people with kind of an axe to grind, uh, but they'll, they'll tell you what it's like at schools, and like I can read the YIS one, and some aspects of it are true, and some aspects I can tell somebody really wanted to say something negative about the school for whatever reason. So you kind of have to take those with a grain of salt. But if you're really into it and you want to go recruiting and you want to hear like a little bit of the backstory, that's a good website, International Schools Review. Um, and I should mention that the recruiting season is now. If you want to be overseas next year, you should be looking now. You should be registered for a job fair now. Uh, job fairs start, they've already started, so there's already been the administrative recruiting fair was already uh, last week or two weeks ago, and then the, the big job fairs for Asia are uh, in January in Bangkok, and then they'll move um, west from there. So there'll be big fairs in North America in February, and they'll, they'll have smaller fairs the rest of the year, but usually they're in Boston, New York area in February. So if you're interested, go for it. And please write to me. I'd love to help. I, this is my favorite topic of conversation. So I'm definitely seeing someone at the door, which means I probably have to go because it's 12.59. So I'm going to wrap up now, and thank you guys so much. I hope that I have inspired you. If you have any questions or you want to talk further, please contact me because, like I said, that was topic. perfect. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay.
Thank you, Kim. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. We know you have to run. Uh, everyone, uh, we appreciate you coming to the session. We've got one more. Um, we have one single one next hour. Betty uh, Hurley Dasgupta is going to be talking about e-portfolios as environments for global engagement. Um, and then there are a couple after that, I believe. So I hope that you'll stick around and go to our other sessions, and uh, uh, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much for coming, everyone.